Big news! Spinosaurus is in the headlines again. This time, a new piece in the back and forth of whether it spent all of its time in the water or just a little bit of its time in the water has been published by a huge team of researchers. Let's see what the team has come up with and if it stands up to what has been said before. Since thorough descriptions of its most complete specimens were revealed in 2014, the hunting behaviors of Spinosaurus, the biggest known predatory dinosaur to walk the earth, have been the topic of heated scholarly discussion. Spinosaurus was characterized at the time as a semi-aquatic predator that prowled the Cretaceous period riverbanks, wading into the muddy banks to ambush fish with its huge crocodilian jaws and interlocking teeth. German paleontologist Ernst von Stromer revealed the discovery of the sinuous crocodile-esque jaws and partial bones of the gigantic sailback predator Spinosaurus from Egypt's western desert in 1915. Some more bones contributed to his early reconstruction of Spinosaurus as a sailbacked, piscivorous biped, which was reduced to atoms, ash, and floor wax by an Allied bombing raid in World War II. In the past 30 some odd years, additional skull and postcranial bones have been discovered in western Morocco in beds comparable to those found in Egypt. Among these discoveries was a fragmentary skeleton known as a neotype that enabled a more comprehensive reconstruction, seemingly validating the species classification as a semi-aquatic piscivore. These recent finds have pushed Spinosaurus farther from the beach, with some experts speculating that it was well suited for following prey out of the shallows and hunting deep underwater. These claims are supported by recent fossils that show Spinosaurus possessed a fleshy paddle-like tail for swimming and thick bones to let it submerge underwater. However, new research by paleontologists from the University of Chicago and colleagues abroad dismisses this aquatic idea as implausible. They analyzed its ability to propel its massive bulk underwater using updated virtual reconstructions of its skeleton and body mass based on fossils and discovered that while Spinosaurus was a scourge of the shoreline with many adaptations for life at the edge of the water, it would fail as a fully aquatic, agile underwater predator. Based on oxygen isotopes in tooth enamel, the dental rosette likened to the jaws of a conger eel, the alleged elevated positioning of the orbits in the skull for visibility while largely submerged, the hypothetical underwater roll of the dorsal sail, and the infilling of the medullary cavities of hind limbs, speculation has grown as skeletal information on the unusual predator has improved. At this point, I don't think you need that much background on Spinosaurus or the situation we are currently in about the animal, but I do have a fantastic playlist that is now quite thick in content you can check out to get caught up to date. I do need to get on more information about its original discovery and some older literature about the animal, but at this point I'm digressing. The Aquatic Hypothesis the recent finding of the Spinosaurus neotype's tall spined tail bones has reignited the view of Spinosaurus as the first totally aquatic dinosaur, termed the aquatic hypothesis, which makes three main arguments. Spinosaurus, unlike any other non-theropod dinosaur, according to the hypothesis, A. On land, the animal reverted to a quadrupedal stance, as shown by a trunk-positioned center of mass, allegedly knuckle-walking with long-fingered, long-clawed forelimbs. B. Used an extended tail as a novel propulsor organ, or as a subaqueous forager in water to function as a proficient diving pursuit predator. C. Fossils, like all large-bodied secondarily aquatic animals, would be found only in coastal or deep water marine settings and would not be expected to be discovered in freshwater inland areas. 
So far, criticism of the aquatic hypothesis has centered on a different functional explanation for the high-spined tail as a showy component, a super sexy back billboard, as well as mostly qualitative functional interpretations of its skeletal architecture. The aquatic ability of Spinosaurus is still being evaluated biomechanically. Do I think that this animal would have waded into water on a regular basis? Absolutely, but I don't think it was a good swimmer, nor capable of full submergence behavior," said Paul Sereno, PhD, professor of organismal biology and anatomy at UChicago, and lead author of the new study who co-led the initial Spinosaurus discovery in 2014. This is simply not an animal that in your wildest dreams would be dynamic above water as a swimmer, much less underwater. If you recall back to the blockbuster paper that announced and described the tail remains, that team oscillated miniature plastic tail cutouts in a water flume to test out the hydrodynamics of the Spinosaurus tail. This experiment only offered a limited approximation of the biomechanical properties of an eel-like tail, but failed to account for the bizarre front half of the animal. The propulsive capacity of the tail in water was judged to be better than terrestrial counterparts, which unfortunately does not mean much. The center of body mass, a vital functional characteristic for Spinosaurus, has been calculated three times, with each estimate pointing to a different location ranging from the middle of the trunk to a position above the hind limbs. There have been no quantitative comparisons of the size or surface area of Spinosaurus's limbs, hind feet, and tail to analogs in living primary or secondary swimmers. Thus, more realistic biomechanical experiments, quantitative body, axial, and limb comparisons between Spinosaurus and modern primary and secondary swimmers, and a survey of bone structure beyond the femur and shaft of a dorsal rib are required for an effective evaluation of the aquatic hypothesis. These tests and comparisons necessitate an exact 3D digital flesh representation of the animal which also happens to necessitate an accurate skeleton model. Thus started Paul Sereno, Nathan Mervold, Donald Henderson, Frank Fish, Daniel Vidal, Stephanie Baumgart, Tyler Kyler, Kirsten Formoso, and Lauren Conroy's latest Spinosaurus investigation. The new paper, titled matter-of-factly, Spinosaurus is not an aquatic dinosaur, was posted as a preprint at BioRxiv and published November 30th, 2022, in the journal eLife. This research began with the collection of a comprehensive set of CT scans of the ancient bones of Spinosaurus and its African predecessor, Suchomimus. Aquaphilic Terminology the aquatic hypothesis revolves around aquatic status. According to the concept originated by a few researchers over the years, Spinosaurus was the first non-avian dinosaur to have bone modifications specialized to aquatic living and movement, some of which restricted terrestrial function. Spinosaurus, the argument goes, was not just a diving pursuit predator in the open water column, but also a quadruped on land with long clawed forelimbs that were poorly adapted for weight bearing. A subsequent article appeared to diminish that primary assertion by implying that any animal with aquatic habits such as wading, submergence, or diving had an aquatic lifestyle. However, the enlarged definition of aquatic lifestyle distorts the long-standing definition of aquatic as applied to lifestyle. The term aquatic is used to describe either a broad category of lifestyle or, in a more limited capacity, an adaptation of a species or group. A vertebrate with an aquatic lifestyle or aquatic ecology is suited for existence largely or completely in water, with substantially decreased functional capability on land. Aquatic vertebrates like bony fish, sea turtles, and whales live entirely or mostly in water and have extensive cranial, axial, or appendicular adaptations for aquatic life, particularly at greater body sizes. Modern whales, for example, are secondarily aquatic animals that spend their whole lives at sea and have extensive skeletal changes for aquatic sensory and locomotor function. They literally die if they are outside of the water for too long. 
A sea turtle is also regarded as an aquatic reptile, even if it comes ashore temporarily to lay eggs because it spends the great bulk of its life in water, employing highly adapted limbs, flippers, for aquatic movement. Their flippers are horrible at crawling around on land, leaving them particularly vulnerable, hence the only going on to land to lay eggs thing. A semi-aquatic animal is one that has less significant adaptations to an aqueous arena. Regardless of the number of aquatic consumables in its diet, the proportion of time spent in water, or the skill of swimming or diving. Almost all semi-aquatic animals are secondarily aquaphilic, having developed aquatic adaptations over time to improve functional capacity in water without jeopardizing terrestrial performance. Semi-aquatic creatures are in fact semi-terrestrial as well. Freshwater turtles, for example, are classified as semi-aquatic reptiles since they frequent water rather than living solely in an aqueous habitat, can be found in inland settings, and have a variety of less substantial adaptations for aquatic movement. Similarly, living crocodiles and many water birds are exceptional swimmers and divers while retaining high functional capacity on land. Ox, for example, are among the most water-adapted semi-aquatic avians, are agile, wing-propelled, pursuit divers with an ungainly upright stance on land similar to penguins and maintain the capacity to fly and occupy land for lengthy periods of time. Flightless penguins are regarded as aquatic due to their more significant skeletal changes for swimming and deep diving and more limited terrestrial usefulness despite the ability to go on land and stand for extended periods of time when brooding. Because virtually all semi-aquatic animals have an aquatic diet and the capacity to swim or dive, an aquatic designation requires a more fundamental functional loyalty to water. An aquatic adaptation of an organism refers to the function of a specific component, not the organism's general lifestyle. That characteristic should be useful in the present and serve a fundamental role in water. Aquatic adaptations are assumed to have evolved in response to water and cannot have specific functional usefulness in a sub-aerial situation. For example, spinosaurids' shrunken, retracted external nostrils would prevent water intake via the nostrils when eating with the snout submerged. There is currently no credible alternative explanation including terrestrial use for spinosaurids' external nostril shrinkage and retraction, a unique feature among non-avian theropods. The hypertrophied neural spines of Spinosaurus's tail, on the other hand, are equivocal as an aquatic adaptation, since extended tails may act as both aquatic propulsors and terrestrial display features. In other words, it is a bit more up in the air. To be considered an aquatic adaptation, the extended tail's anatomy and function must indisputably demonstrate main usefulness and capability in water as is the case with modern tail-powered primary or secondary aquatic vertebrates like newts, crocodilians, beavers, and otters. The same must be demonstrated or inferred in extinct secondarily aquatic animals. The new team did not discover such substantiating evidence to interpret the heightened tail in Spinosaurus or other Spinosaurids as an aquatic adaptation using different comparative and biomechanical methodologies corroborating similar results obtained recently by the 2021 paper of Dave Hone and Thomas Holtz. A New Approach to investigate the aquatic hypothesis for Spinosaurus, the new team started with CT scans of Spinosaurid fossils from African sites to create high-resolution 3D skeleton reconstructions of Spinosaurus and its ancestor-slash-cousin, Suchomimus. Many vertebrae and long bones in both dinosaurs have extensive internal pneumatic or medullary space, which has implications for possible buoyancy. Pneumatic refers to air-filled pockets, while medullary refers to marrow-filled spaces. The CT-based 3D skeleton model of Spinosaurus differs dramatically in skeletal proportions from the 2D silhouette sketch utilized in the aquatic theory. The team wrapped the skeleton model with flesh based on CT scans of modern reptile and avian analogs that revealed muscle volume and air gaps. 
Internal air passages, such as the trachea, lungs, and air sacs, were formed and positioned, as in modern analogs, to generate a 3D flesh model for Spinosaurus. Depending on existing squamate, crocodilian, and avian circumstances, they developed three alternatives for internal air volume and allocated densities to body partitions based on local tissue types and air space. The surface area and volume of the flesh model, as well as its many bodily components, were computed. This integrated flesh model was posed in bipedal, hybrid, and axial-powered stances, the latter two based on the swimming postures of modern semi-aquatic reptiles. The center of mass and center of buoyancy of Spinosaurus on land, the depth of water at the point of flotation, and the neutral position of the flesh model in deeper water were all estimated. The team assessed the maximum force production of an alligator's tail using biomechanical formulas and data from living alligators, which was then utilized to compute maximum swimming velocity at the surface and underwater. The team also assessed its aquatic stability, maneuverability, and diving capacity, comparing all of these functional characteristics to existing large-bodied aquatic animals. The team then examined the anatomy and function of comparable spine-supported sails over the trunk and tail in lizards, as well as the shape of tail vertebrae in tail-powered secondary swimmers. They also looked at the relative size or surface area of appendages in a variety of secondary swimmers, as well as the surface area of crocodilians' foot paddles and tail scale. Finally, they looked at the Spinosaurid fossil record to see where Spinosaurid fossils had been discovered and examined the range to see if Spinosaurids, especially Spinosaurus, were constrained to coastal marine settings like all big secondarily aquatic species. They reconstructed the Spinosaurid phylogeny to identify significant stages in the evolution of Spinosaurid piscivorous adaptations and sail structures, adding additional Spinosaur specimens from Niger. Results The adult Spinosaurus skeleton reconstruction produced by the researchers is slightly under 14 meters 45 feet in length, which is more than 1 meter shorter than originally reported by past researchers. When compared to the 2D graphical reconstruction of the aquatic hypothesis, significant variations are visible. The length of the presacral or before the pelvis vertebral column, rib cage depth, and forelimb length in that reconstruction were overstated by 10%, 25%, and 30% respectively, compared to dimensions based on CT scanned fossils here in this new study. All of these proportional overestimations have your neck, trunk, forelimb move the center of mass forward when translated to a flesh model. Spinosaurus's hind limb long bones, the femur, tibia, fibula, metatarsals, lack the medullary cavity found in other dinosaurs, particularly theropods. Spinosaurus's infield hind leg bones were formerly thought to be ballast for swimming, not so according to the new study. They found that the infield state is varied as seen by the shallow medullary cavity in a femur of a somewhat bigger individual than the neotype, which was the one found in Morocco with the tail. Furthermore, the bone infilling is fibrolamellar and cancellous, similar to that of other large-body terrestrial dinosaurs and mammals with infilled medullary cavities. Dense pachyostotic bone, on the other hand, makes up the solid and occasionally enlarged bones of many secondarily aquatic animals that utilize increased skeletal density as ballast. Pachyostotic bones are those that are extra thick on the inside. The reduction of internal air-filled voids in the bone is called osteosclerosis, and this can co-occur with pachyostosis in aquatic animals. Medullary space, or the hollows that hold the bone marrow, may be seen in the majority of Spinosaurus and Suchomimus forelimb bones. A huge medullary cavity occupies the center of the first half of the tail vertebrae, while extensive air-filled pneumatic spaces exist in the center and neural arches of the neck vertebrae. Spinosaurus's less dense internal marrow and air-filled voids more than compensated for the additional density of infilled medullary space in the comparably decreased hind leg long bones. Hind limb bone infilling is better described as compensation for the smaller size of the hind limb long bones, which must sustain theropod body masses at the higher end of their range. 
When the medullary cavity is filled, bending strength improves by up to 35%. In other words, they had short stubby hind legs and needed extra thick and chunky bones in those legs to compensate for their shortcomings. Model Form and Function The team added flesh to the adult skeleton model and separated it into body divisions that were modified for density. CT cross-sections of modern lizards, crocodilians, and birds were used to guide muscle volume, while internal airspace, such as that taken up by the pharynx trachea, lungs, and paraxial air sacs, was modeled after lizard, crocodilian, and avian anatomy. Surface area and volume of the whole body and body parts were estimated and body partitions were assigned densities equivalent to those found in existing analogs. They placed the integrated flesh model in bipedal, hybrid, and axial-powered swimming stances for biomechanical investigation. The flesh model's center of mass and center of balance were calculated to assess habitual posture on land and in shallow water water depth at the point of flotation, and swimming velocity, stability, maneuverability, and diving capability in deeper water. Regardless of the volume of internal airspace, the center of mass is located above the ground contact of symmetrically positioned hind feet. Thus, Spinosaurus possessed a bipedal posture on land, contrasting to the aquatic hypothesis's trunk-centered center of mass. Consistent with a bipedal position, the hand is built for prey capture and manipulation rather than weight support. They could not hold themselves up by their hands. This is something that I have brought up before in previous videos and something that other researchers not working with Nizar Ibrahim have also brought up before and even discussed in other publications. Even with a center of mass ahead of the pelvis and legs, Spinosaurus could not have walked on its hands. It did not have the adaptations to support its weight on its knuckles, nor any other position. It is partially why the land-living habit of the animal was kept in question. How could it stand if it were so front-heavy? Some researchers, like Mark Witten, did some informal and preliminary analyses, which I have covered before, and observed that the animal could still have stood up on land while being front-heavy. It would just need to adjust its default body position from the horizontal one of most theropods, which should be possible. Adult spinosaurs can feed while standing in water and can float in water deeper than 2.6 meters, 8.5 feet. Trunk airspace tilts the model's front end upward in hybrid or axial swimming stances. The flesh model of spinosaurs has a body mass of 7,390 kilograms or 8 tons and an average density of 833 kilograms per meter cubed, which is much smaller than the density of freshwater 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed and saltwater 1,026 kilograms per meters cubed, as well as the average density of modern crocodilians. Bony Model Compare and Contrast The team compared their Spinosaurus digital skeleton model to a previously published 2D silhouette skeletal reconstruction from the Aquatic Hypothesis paper by Ibrahim and colleagues, both of which are based mostly on fossils from the incinerated holotype and the confusing Moroccan neotype. The Sereno team recorded the reconstructions by superimposing the neotype's four longest intact bones the femur, tibia, ilium, and ischium. Significant discrepancies are visible in various aspects with significant consequences for calculating center of balance and mass. When the hip and tail vertebral columns are aligned at the hip, they are virtually comparable in length, but the prehip column is much larger, about 10%, in the aquatic hypothesis reconstruction. The additional pre-hip vertebral column length is seen in the neck between vertebrae C2 to 10 and the torso between vertebrae D4 to 13, as can be observed by matching the skeletons along the dorsal column. The trunk in the digital skeletal model is not as deep as that in the skeletal silhouette illustration. Unlike the digital reconstruction and most previous silhouette reconstructions for non-avian theropods, the contour of the belly indicated by the gastral basket and the coracoids of the pectoral girdle extends about 25% more bellyward, or ventrally, than the ends of the pubes. The model's ribcage length is commensurate with the sole, well-preserved spinosaurid ribcage known to date, which happens to be from old snooty face Suchomimus. 
Finally, the skeleton silhouette drawing's forelimb is 30% longer than the digital reconstructions. The Moroccan neotype is the only related spinosaur specimen that has forelimb bones preserved. In this case, a partial manual digit 2, a fingi. The preserved hand fingies are thin with deeply cleft distal condyles, allowing them to be compared to other phalanges from the Chemchem group. Condyles are the knuckles of finger and toe bones, and cleft just refers to the split in the surfaces that articulate with one another. The reconstruction of the hand in the new digital model is based on a forelimb of the close cousin Irritator that was recently described. The proportions of the more proximal, which if you recall means closer to the body, forelimb segments and the pectoral girdle are based on the original holotype specimens of Baryonyx and Suchomimus. Spinosaurus's forelimb is strong and long in comparison to other non-avian theropods, albeit significantly shorter than in prior reconstructions. The longer pre-hip proportions, deeper torso and longer forelimb of the skeletal reconstruction and flesh model used by the aquatic hypothesis show significant additional body mass before the hip joint. That increased front loading appears to be the primary determinant in the center of mass's mid-trunk position, which is the basis for considering Spinosaurus as a quadruped on land. Flesh Reconstruction of Axial Musculature The Sereno team used CT-based research on ostriches and alligators to determine the amount of axial musculature in Spinosaurus. To get to the bottom of tail muscle mass, the team used CT images of several reptiles, including the sail-backed basilisk lizard Basilicus plumifrons. There are two types of muscles in the trunk of adult vertebrate animals. This is the cross-section of the trunk of an animal. Those white lines are septum, and they separate blocks of muscles. The hypaxial muscles are those on the bottom or ventral side of the trunk. The epaxial muscles are therefore those blocks on top or on the dorsal side of the trunk. For those that are curious, hypaxial muscles include some vertebral muscles, the diaphragm, the abdominal muscles, and all limb muscles, while epaxial muscles include muscles associated with the vertebrae, ribs, and base of the skull. These had to be estimated for the fleshed-out digital spinosaur model. All of the stuff I am going to talk to you about next can be observed in this diagram, figure 10 in the paper. Each of those cross sections were estimated based off known musculature in modern animals, those that are known in extinct animals, the size of the bones, and some math. The Sereno team calculated the vertical extent of epaxial muscle mass in Spinosaurus as double the centrum height, measured upward from the base of the neural spine. The transverse breadth of epaxial musculature was calculated to be somewhat smaller than that of hypaxial muscles, broadest ventrally and decreasing dorsally to the midline. The team assessed the vertical depth of Spinosaurus hypaxial muscle mass to be roughly twice the chevron length in the front of the tail and one and a half times the chevron length in the middle and end of the tail. The transverse breadth of hypaxial muscles was determined to be double the length of the transverse processes, which are those bony bits of the vertebrae that stick out to the sides. CT cross-sections of modern reptiles reveal significant muscle mass in the back parts of the tail vertebrae bones that stick out to the side, those processes, in the front and middle sections of the tail. Several cross-sections of the crested basilisk provided important information on the arrangement of axial muscles in a lizard with a back-to-tail sail. The trunk and tail epaxial musculature accounts for less than one-third of total axial muscle volume in the lizard. Tail neural spines extend beyond the epaxial musculature to support the sail to a larger extent in the tail's middle and back ends. Approximately one-third, about 29.3% of the neural spine projections that are dorsally near the base of the tail support the sail. Approximately three-quarters, or about 76.8% of the neural spine projections support the sail at mid-tail. The hypaxial musculature reaches considerably below the chevron's distal end. Chevrons are those little pointy ribby bones under the tail vertebrae. The chevron sits internal to roughly one-half 
52.6% of hypaxial muscle depth at the base of the tail, with the remaining 47.4% distal to the end of the chevron. The chevrons are correspondingly longer, farther along the tail, supporting roughly two-thirds or 67% of hypaxial muscle depth, with approximately one-third of hypaxial musculature beyond the distal end of the chevron. These cross-sections demonstrate the existence of significant muscle mass in the front through the mid-portions of the tail ventral to the distal end of the chevrons. <sighs> and we're done with that part. Flesh Model Density Partitions, Dimensions, and Properties The digital skeleton model was covered in flesh using ZBrush, based on current muscle mass data and CT scans of several modern analogs. The team inserted anatomically formed and positioned air spaces, the pharynx trachea, paraxial air sacs, and lungs of varying sizes, minimum for lizard, medium for crocodilian, and maximum for avian, into the head, neck, and torso. A mesh was placed over the flesh model for extra measurements. To assign suitable densities, the flesh model was separated into six segments – axial body presacral, axial caudal, dorsal to caudal sail, forelimbs, hindlimbs, and lungs. Body parts were assigned densities depending on their predicted composition, with values ranging from fat at 900 grams per liter to compact bone at 2,000 grams per liter. The average whole body density of Spinosaurus, 833 grams per liter, compares favorably to estimates for other non-avian dinosaurs, which range from 800 to 900 grams per liter. Numerous functional dimensions of the adult flesh model were assembled and separated into 10 bodily segments, listing volumes, and exterior surface areas for each. Center of mass was defined as the horizontal distance from the acetabulum's apex, the x-coordinate, and the vertical distance from the ground surface under the foot's sole, the y-coordinate. The acetabulum is of course the socket of the hip bone, where the center of mass and balance is often closely linked. This is technically the fourth center of mass estimate for Spinosaurus, so obviously the Sereno team believes this one to be the most accurate. The team preferred to take measurements from the acetabulum rather than the tail tip, which, as with Spinosaurus, is frequently speculative due to the scarcity of entirely preserved tail vertebral columns. Utilizing the acetabulum's apex rather than its cranial end was proposed for three reasons. Firstly, the acetabulum's apex is a more immediately recognized landmark than the acetabulum's poorly defined front margin or rim. Secondly, given its proximity to the rotating point for body mass centered on the hind limbs, the apex of the acetabulum, rather than the cranial end, is a more functionally understandable place from which to measure center of mass. And thirdly, because the femoral head's dorsal or proximal articular end is near to the acetabulum's apex, the length of the femur and the distance that center of mass lies more forward may be readily compared. With avian-like airspace, the maximum, center of mass is positioned only 15.3 centimeters in front of the apex of the acetabulum and clearly over the toes for a bipedal stance. The smallest airspace option modeled on lizards, the minimum, only 4% of body volume, generates the heaviest torso and displaces center of mass forward an extra 13.2 centimeters to a distance of 28.5 centimeters from the apex of the acetabulum. In this location, center of mass is still about 12 centimeters short of the midpoint along the length of the femur. In this worst-case situation for internal air volume, center of mass is still positioned above the hind limb's toes. Spinosaurus's necessary quadrupedal stance on land is not supported by this new flesh model. Swimming Velocity the swimming velocity of living lizards and crocs at the water surface is usually backed up by paddling their feetsies and swishing their bodies and tails from side to side. At their moderate to maximum possible speeds, they opt for switching their bodies and tails only. The team used the bulk momentum formula from MJ Lighthill's research to estimate maximum surface and underwater swimming velocity for the Spinosaurus flesh model. Assuming a fully compliant, alligator-like tail, values for amplitude, wavelength, and frequency, tail thrust, and maximum velocity, the team determined the whole thing as this stupid useful math equation. P 
of t equals negative 164.93 plus 1899.1 times u minus 896.35 times u squared. Assuming turbulent conditions, a body drag coefficient of 0.0035 was estimated for a Reynolds number of 752,400 at a swimming speed of 1 meters per second. The total power from estimates of drag increased 3 to 5 fold to account for undulation of the tail, near surface wave formation, and increased sail drag when underwater. The addition of the sail increases the drag on the Spinosaur's body by 33.4%. The intersection of the thrust power curve and drag power curves where the animal would be swimming at a constant velocity indicates slow maximum velocity at the surface, about 0.8 meters per second, and only slightly greater when submerged, at about 1.4 meters per second. Maximum tail thrust in Spinosaurus is 820 watts, 683 newtons, or 154 pounds, a relatively low value for the considerable tail muscle mass in this big-assed, big-ass dinosaur. Only a minor amount of tail muscle power, however, is given to the water as thrust during swishing. As a result, maximum velocity is only 1.2 meters per second an order of magnitude less than modern large-bodied pursuit predators above a meter in length. These species, mackerel sharks, billfish, dolphins, and killer whales are capable of maximum velocities of 10 to 33 meters per second, which is pretty damn fast. Stability Stability and the capacity for an animal to right itself are important when slicing and gliding through water. When positioned upright in water, the trunk sail of Spinosaurus sticks out. The flesh model, however, is particularly susceptible to long-axis rotation given the proximity of the center of mass and balance with stable equilibrium attained when floating on its side, providing the scientific community with one of the best scientific diagrams that look like shitposts to come out of the academic paleontology community. It's okay, I sleep. I sleep here. Riding the body requires substantial torque, about 5,000 newton meters, that is impossible to generate with vertical limbs and a tail with far less maximum force output, about 700 newtons. This stability predicament remains even with the smallest internal airspace. The absence of vertical stability and riding potential in water stands in stark contrast to the condition in modern crocodilians and marine mammals who are experts at twirling and remaining steadfast when slipping and sliding through their environment. Maneuverability Water maneuverability, the unappealing and unsexy combination of acceleration, turning radius, and speed, decreases with body length, which is exacerbated in Spinosaurus by its inflexible trunk and expansive, unretractable sail. Larger-bodied secondary swimmers capable of pursuing prey in open water, on the other hand, have fusiform body forms with a narrow tail peduncle for efficient tail propulsion, like the ichthyosaurs and whales, have control surfaces for reorientation and narrow extensions like bills to increase velocity in close encounters with smaller, more maneuverable prey. Semi-aquatic pursuit predators are uncommon, with only the small-bodied, very agile otters that use undulatory swimming. Axial Compare and Contrast Axial flexibility is required for primary or secondary swimmers to use axial propulsion. The torso and pelvic vertebrae of Spinosaurus, on the other hand, are immobilized by interlocking articulations, an expansive, inflexible dorsal sail formed of closely spaced neural spines and united centers of pelvic vertebrae. Spinosaurus's tail neural spines reinforce a bone-supported tail sail by forming an echelon of neural spines that bridge many vertebral segments and efficiently resist bending at vertebral joints. It's not very bendy. The centers of Spinosaurus's tail vertebrae had fairly consistent sub-quadrate proportions along the bulk of the tail in lateral view, as opposed to crocodilians and other secondarily aquatic squamates narrowing spool-shaped centra, which promotes distal flexibility during tail undulation. These prominent structural elements of the tail imply that it served as a pliant billboard rather than a flexible fluke. 
No primary or secondary vertebrate swimmer, including sailfish, has a comparable drag magnifying inflexible dorsal sail, despite the fact that the dorsal fin is entirely retractable and formed of elastic spines in membrane. Secondary swimmers such as crocodilians, mosasaurs, and whales, on the other hand, have elastic soft tissues free of bone that extend to form a flexible tail paddle or fluke. Spine-supported, torso-to-tail sails aligned with median head crests, on the other hand, have evolved many times in modern lizards for intraspecific display rather than aquatic propulsion, as seen in the agamids, iguanians, and chameleons. Semi-aquatic sailfin and basilisk lizards, for example, do not swim with their sails, spend little time submerged, and are not aquatic pursuit predators. In fact, they run across the water. I don't exactly see an 8-ton predator doing that. As previously stated, most secondary swimmers' center tail vertebrae proportions grade from subquadrate, meaning a rounded square, to spool-shaped in the last half of the tail to promote flexibility and undulatory amplitude but Spinosaurus maintains rather constant proportions along the tail. This subquadrate proportional uniformity in Spinosaurus should not be mistaken with a more developed fish-like pattern of uniform, short, disc-shaped centra that evolved in parallel in Mosasaurs. Appendicular Compare and Contrast Secondary swimmers have a lower surface area of their appendages, the fore and hind limbs specifically, to reduce drag as terrestrially adapted limbs are ineffective at doing the swimmy swims. Spinosaurus appendage surface area, on the other hand, is far bigger than that of reptilian and mammalian secondary swimmers and even exceeds that of terrestrial predators Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus. That means that the well-known terrestrial Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus had limbs that could help them swim better than Spinosaurus. Some secondary swimmers employ interdigital webbing to enhance the area of the foot paddle. They have webbed feetsies. Modern crocodilians paddle with their limbs really only upon launch and at a slow speed before tucking them against the body and swishing about. Crocodilian toe webbing, which is more developed and always present in the hind foot, increases surface area only a bit, about 20%. The research team showed that crocodilian foot paddle area scales isometrically across a wide range of body sizes. As a result, as body size increases, the crocodilian foot paddle becomes less efficient for propelling the beast. Nonetheless, a crocodilian of Spinosaurid size would have a foot paddle area an order of magnitude bigger than Spinosaurus. Even a completely webbed hind foot in Spinosaurus, which no clear evidence supports, is considerably too tiny to have functioned for considerable water propulsion or stabilizing control. Kind of killing the Duckasaurus concept here. Paleohabitats and Evolution the majority of Spinosaurus fossils are found in northern African peripheral basins in deltaic silt put down after an early late Cretaceous transgression. However, these deposits also contain the majority of non-Spinosaur dinosaur bones, which may have been transferred to some extent from interior environments to coastal delta dumps. Because fossil transfer is one way, downstream, determining genuine habitat range requires recording the inland fossil record as well. Sereno and his team recently discovered Spinosaurus fossils in two interior basins in Niger, quite distant from a maritime shoreline. They were buried with terrestrial animals in river overbank deposits that also contained the remains of verbachisaurid and titanosaurian sauropods. The inland placement of these fossils calls into question Spinosaurus' characterization as a highly specialized aquatic predator that hunted and captured its prey in the water column. All large-bodied secondarily aquatic animals are marine, whether living or extinct. Sea turtles, sirenians, seals and whales versus protostegid turtles, ichthyosaurs, mediterranean crocodilomorphs, and plesiosaurs. None of these diversified water beasts can be found in both saltwater and freshwater environments. Secondarily, freshwater aquatic animals with marine ancestors are itty-bitty things, such as river dolphins of 2.5 meters, small lake-bound seals of 2 meters, the river-bound Amazonian manatee of 2.5 meters, and a few mosasaurs and plesiosaurs of modest body size. Large-bodied semi-aquatic reptiles, on the other hand, are found both on the shore and inland. 
Sarcasuchus, a 12-meter-long semi-aquatic crocodilomorph, existed in the same inland area as Sukumimus. Spinosaurus was a semi-aquatic bipedal ambush predator that frequented the edges of both coastal and interior streams, according to the fossil record. The large body size of Spinosaurus and older similar forms such as Sukumimus further mitigates against an aquatic interpretation for the former, as it would be the sole occurrence in vertebrates of the emergence of a secondarily aquatic animal with a body size more than 2 to 3 meters. The substantial adaptations needed to fully re-enter the aquatic environment after a land-based existence appear to be more common at smaller body sizes. All other large-bodied secondarily aquatic vertebrates like the ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, mediterranean crocodilomorphs, protostegid turtles, mosasaurs, sirenians, and whales evolved the adaptations needed for an aquatic lifestyle at a small body size, gradually increasing in size once fully established within the marine realm. The rejection of the aquatic status of Spinosaurus by Sereno and his team does not exclude the semi-aquatic habits or fish-eating affinities of the animal. The team performed a phylogenetic analysis for Spinosaurus to get another understanding of its evolution over time. The examination, which included a large dataset of Spinosaurids, reveals piscivorous or fish-eating adaptations in the earliest Spinosaurids of 130 million years ago that improve prey acquisition in shallow water and heightened visual display features. The skull is decorated by an elongated snout topped with a dental rosette of pike-like teeth for snaring fish, retracted external nostrils to avoid water intake, and a high nasal crest. The formation of a decorative crest above the snout is followed by the formation of a variable height postcranial sail, supported by neural spines of the back half of the back, hip, and tail vertebrae. In addition to all of this, the earliest known spinosaurids have vertebrae in the front of their torso, specialized in such a way to require a new term. They are cervicalized, or adapted to be more like the vertebrae of the neck. This adaptation is hypothesized to increase the ability for the neck to flex downwards and to increase the practical neck length. This may have been an adaptation to snap at prey in the water. Using the second back vertebra of the terrestrial predator Allosaurus as a model, the spinosaurid vertebra exhibits significant change. The front face is convex. There are prominent keels for muscular attachment on the underside. The neural spine is shrunk, and the zygopophyses are large and planar. Giraffids have similarly cervicalized the first thoracic vertebra to promote upwards flexing and increase effective neck length for a similar reason. All spinosaurids, including baryonychines, have heightened neural spines on the trunk and tail to variable degrees. The traits I mentioned earlier, to improve piscivory and display, appear to be shared by all currently known spinosaurids and form the stage 1 evolution seen in this diagram. The baryonychine spinosaurs, like Sukamimus, Baryonyx, and Ceratosuchops, were fancy. They had nasal crests and brow ridges for display and telling each other apart. These traits may be unique to this group of spinosaurids, as the later spinosaur-grade spinosaurs didn't have as elaborate cranial crests. Spinosaurines have spaced out smooth teeth for efficient puncturing, smaller, more retracted external nostrils to avoid water intake, more prominent muscle attachments on the underside of the neck and back vertebrae for lunging downwards, and scythe-shaped hand claws for slicing, all of which are piscivorous adaptations. A heightened cranial crest, a low neck sail, and an extreme torso to tail sail are all adaptations for greater display. What's the verdict? Goodall and Stromer noted the unique adaptations in Spinosaurus jaws and neural spines for piscivory and flamboyant display, respectively, in 1915, identifying modern analogs for both. Nothing remotely resembling this feature had ever been documented in non-avian dinosaurs. More recently, a group of researchers have gone even farther, aiming to understand how this enormous predatory dinosaur interacted with coastal waterways. All have been hampered by the specimen's fragmentary nature, as all of Stromer's Egyptian fossils were lost during World War II. Indeed, the discovery of a fresh partial skeleton from Morocco, as well as its tail six years later, sparked hypotheses for semi-aquatic and aquatic interpretations. 
unlike Dinochirus, whose mystery was more or less entirely solved in one fell swoop, with two relatively complete skeletons completely overlapping the original material, Spinosaurus remains elusive and more tantalizing than ever. The Spinosaurus tail's ostensibly eel-like appearance, considered a new propulsor organ, inspired the aquatic hypothesis, which saw Spinosaurus as a tail-propelled diving predator that chased and captured its prey in the water column. In contrast, as would be expected of a secondarily aquatic reptile, its terrestrial skills were viewed as severely hampered by a trunk-positioned center of body mass that would require a quadrupedal stance on land, and the employment of long-clawed forelimbs not adapted for weight-bearing. A 2022 paper by Matteo Fabri and colleagues, which I covered here, employed bone compactness to suggest Spinosaurus was a subaqueous forager with diving credentials, which was presented as support for the aquatic hypothesis. The aquatic hypothesis, however, demands considerably more than demonstrating that its tail was a powerful source of propulsion or that its bones were slightly more compact. To determine that Spinosaurus was an aquatic diver and predator, Sereno and colleagues posit one must also comprehend its buoyancy, stability, velocity, maneuverability, and diving capability in water. These calculations require a correct flesh rendering, which is created on top of an accurate bone model, something I should add that is kind of iffy by default. Even the more recent Moroccan Spinosaurus skeleton is not complete and also cannot be reliably identified as belonging to the Spinosaurus aegyptiaca species. There is a whole complex of Spinosaurus species and related genera across North Africa that are all extremely fragmentary and differ in minute ways. I think, in order to take what the Sereno paper is saying, we must assume that the neotype, the eel-tailed freak from Morocco, is a Spinosaurus and also a Spinosaurus aegyptiacus. That being said, this distinction doesn't invalidate the results, it just means the study is more working with a separate species to the original Spinosaurus. To start making an accurate skeletal and flesh model of Spinosaurus, the team started with CT scans of the fossils uncovering significant difference between the original 3D skeletal model and the 2D skeletal silhouette employed by the work of Nizar Ibrahim and colleagues for their aquatic hypothesis. Comparisons to the 2D model with the more accurate tail demonstrate that skeletal areas anterior to the hips are extended in length and depth beyond the proportions of the CT-based reconstruction, pushing the center of mass forward from the hips to the trunk in the resultant flesh model. The trunk length of both earlier Spinosaurus varieties was expanded due to abnormal downward flexing of the dorsal column, which also scattered the sail's neural spines. The shorter torso has a straighter column with fewer dispersed neural spines when the neotype, the CT scanned or reconstructed holotype Spinosaurus dorsal vertebrae are rearticulated in osteological neutral position. Furthermore, based on the remaining rib parts of the holotype and neotype as well as the almost full rib cage known for Suchomimus, the rib cage is not as deep. In the flesh model, these proportions successfully lower the volume of the trunk. According to the analysis of CT scans of crocodilians and other reptiles, the flesh model utilized by the aquatic hypothesis exaggerated muscle mass towards the base of the tail. These differences in center of mass and buoyancy in Spinosaurs are not insignificant. The dinosaur stood up on its hind legs like all other theropods. With a more accurate flesh model, the team conducted a series of biomechanical experiments on its performance in water, discovering that it fell well short in all essential criteria. Spinosaurs failed catastrophically in terms of maximum swimming speed on the surface or underwater, ability to write and remain stable or move underwater, and generation of the force required to overcome buoyancy and to fully dive. Spinosaurus was a shaky, sluggish swimmer with little ability to submerge. These are significant biomechanical obstacles that the aquatic hypothesis must overcome. The team considered other comparative methods to test the aquatic hypothesis, such as plotting Spinosaurus against various living and extinct secondarily aquatic amniotes to consider appendage area, the size of crocodilians' foot and tail paddles, tail structure, and the habitats occupied by large-bodied secondarily aquatic vertebrates. 
Spinosaurus fails all of these comparable criteria as well because it is similar to other theropod dinosaurs in terms of limb size, other reptiles that employ midline sails for show, and semi-aquatic reptiles in terms of the diversity of coastal and inland environments populated. Although more Spinosaurus and Spinosaur fossils will undoubtedly be discovered, the overall skeleton proportions and shape of Spinosaurus are well established. Many subtle issues about the anatomy and function of this fascinating group of predators will undoubtedly continue to spark debate. As a result, the aquatic hypothesis is unlikely to persist as a realistic lifestyle explanation. So, what is our understanding of Spinosaurus's lifestyle? Spinosaurus, according to the Sereno team's research and that of Dave Hone and Thomas Holtz's 2021 study, is a bipedal, semi-aquatic dinosaur that hunted giant fish in ambush while wading into shallow, coastal, and riverine waters. This study yielded 13 major results, all of which may be tested. Number 1. Adult Spinosaurus had a body length of under 14 meters with the axial column in neutral position. Number 2. Reduced hind limb long bones in the Moroccan neotype skeleton are infilled, likely as an adaptation to support weight on land rather than functioning as ballast to increased density in water. Number 3. The segment crossing tail neural spines in Spinosaurus suggests that its tail functioned more as a pliant billboard than flexible fluke. Number 4. Spinosaurus, like Suchomimus and other Spinosaurids, was bipedal on land with its center of mass positioned over its hind feet. The long clawed forelimbs of Spinosaurus were not used in weight support on land. Number 5. Spinosaurus could wade into shallow water for feeding with flotation occurring at water depths greater than about 2.6 meters. Number 6. An adult flesh model of Spinosaurus has a body mass of about 7,400 kilograms and average density of about 830 kilograms per meters cubed, which is considerably less than the density of salt water, which is about 1,026 kilograms per meters cubed. Number 7. Spinosaurus was incapable of diving given its buoyancy and incompressible trunk. Full submergence would require 15 to 25 times the maximum force output of its tail, depending on estimated lung volume. Number 8. Spinosaurus was unstable in deeper water with little ability to right itself, swim, or maneuver underwater. Maximum power from its tail, assuming it could undulate as in alligators, is less than 700 newtons, which would generate a top speed of about 1 meters per second, an order of magnitude slower than living, large-bodied pursuit predators. Number 9. All living and extinct, large-bodied, above 2 meters long, secondarily aquatic vertebrates are strictly marine, whereas fossils pertaining to Spinosaurus have been found in inland basins distant from a marine coast. Number 10. Transition to a semi-aquatic lifestyle, as occurred in the evolution of spinosaur theropods, can occur at any body size. Transition to an aquatic lifestyle among tetrapods, in contrast, has only occurred at relatively small body size, less than 3 meters, with subsequent radiation once in the marine realm into larger body sizes. Number 11. Spinosaurus is interpreted as a semi-aquatic shoreline ambush predator, more closely tied to waterways than Baryonychine spinosaurids. Number 12. Spinosaurids flourished over a relatively brief Cretaceous interval, about 35 million years, in circumtethian habitats with minimal impact on aquatic habitats globally. Number 13. Two phases are apparent in evolution of aquatic adaptations among spinosaurids. The second distinguishing Spinosaurians as the most semi-aquatic of non-avian dinosaurs. Dr. Sereno stated, Non-avian dinosaurs dominated the world for 150 million years, but they never went into the water in a serious way, he said. Of course they could swim just like we do, that doesn't mean we're aquatic. We're talking about whether they were truly adapted to life in the water, and that's the central question behind all this attention on Spinosaurus. I hate to cut and run, but I am exhausted and you should be too. I hope to never hear about Spinosaurus for at least another year. But this new paper is nothing short of interesting.
For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda, Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman.